Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. In the Buddhist teachings, um, there are two directions within which we can approach our spiritual life. One is, if you will, from the bottom up, the kind of climbing the mountain direction in which you feel that you are um, unworthy and um, notice all of your defects and faults and try to change and purify and transform and make yourself better. And I don't know who said it. There's a certain type of person in whose mind the divine is always mixed up with dieting and vitamins and things like that. <laughs> There's some, Alan Watts called it, religion is a grim duty somehow, that you're going to sign of fix yourself. Um, and that's, that's kind of an exaggeration, but there's a certain attitude of trying to change and develop. And a whole other spirit, which is equally prevalent, and I think for our time very important, is the understanding of a fundamental uh, wakefulness um, and compassion that is your true nature, and that the mind or the heart is luminous, as the Buddha um, but it gets caught, obscured like the fog or the clouds in various uh, confusions and fears and desires uh, and loses touch with this basic and fundamental openness. Um, my teacher Ajahn Chah used to say that if you were in the monastery and practicing for the, you know, a period of time and you hadn't experienced a real f- taste of freedom in the first six months or year of your practice, then you'd been wasting your time. You'd missed the boat somehow. Um, Now one of the languages for describing this awakening to freedom uh, is what the Buddha called the factors or the qualities of enlightenment. Um, And it's the most frequent description in the Pali, uh, the kind of the text of the elders, of what the awakened heart is like. Um, And I want to speak of them tonight primarily in that, not so much in the notion of development, but really of remembering. I see a practice uh, that we do in the fundamental spiritual practice is of remembering in a lot of levels of meaning of that. To remember is to bring all the members back together into one whole. And it's also to remember something deep in ourselves. Um, And these qualities which speak to our inherent nobility or wakefulness or that possibility within us, our true nature, include mindfulness and joy and uh, clear seeing and calm and concentration and uh, um, a kind of... um, equanimity and balance in the midst of all things, uh, and a vitality or aliveness. But they start, the first of them, with the quality of mindfulness. That's sort of the overarching um, factor, and then the others follow with it. And this quality of mindfulness, which we've talked about on other evenings, I'd rather call it mindfulness, a fullness of being, can also be called sacred presence or a quality of attention and wakefulness that is really here in the reality of the present. And it asks a kind of shift of identity. Some of the kind of questions or topics that were raised of letting go or loss or worry and attachment, which come to us all in different forms. The end of a relationship the fear about money, the shifting roles as our children are growing or as our parents are growing older, Um, those kind of changes that are inevitable in one's life, you can't stop them, can you? You And then you start to think and worry and imagine them all the more, so much that we're not really living here. What mindfulness begins to tell us is that we live in the world of change 
And yet there is an awareness, a spaciousness or openness that can allow that change without being lost in it, without being lost in the past, without being lost in the future, that can really be alive each day and take each day as it is. Because actually that's all we have is one day at a time. And anything else is just a fantasy or in some cases a nightmare, right? (laughs) Let me see this poem from Rilke, if I can find this. Breathing, you invisible poem, complete interchange of our own essence with world space, you counterweight in which I rhythmically happen, single wave motion whose gradual sea I am. You, most inclusive of all possible seas, space grown warm. How many regions in space have already been inside me? There are winds that seem like my relatives. Do you recognize me, air, full of places I once absorbed? And what happens when we sit, and sitting isn't the only way to be mindful, you can be mindful as you jog or drive or bake bread or whatever it happens to be, but we sit because our lives are complicated and we forget. And to sit is an invitation to this sacred presence which the breath breathes itself and the mind which is caught up in attachment and fears in what's called the body of fear, this small sense of self sees all those stories. They're really like movies, aren't they? They come and, you know, they have good plots. I mean, they're not new plots, but they're good plots, you know, and they star (laughs) you-know-who. As Miss Piggy would say, moi, right? (laughs) And to be mindful isn't to get rid of our experience, but to notice what's there and become bigger than that, to become spacious enough so that the feelings of loss or fear or longing or sobbing, my teacher said, if you haven't wept deeply, you haven't really begun to meditate. Mm. Maybe it's a year of sobbing, who knows? Like we talked about last week, a year of doing metta for oneself. I think that our society is not one that has too many tears but that we haven't really grieved many of the things, the, the warehousing of mostly men and our, you know, two million people in our prisons uh, could shed a lot of tears for that. Um, the tears for the potential that this country is founded on and the fact that um, we still make a huge amount of our money as a nation, by exporting weapons and killing machines. It's one of our main exports. So to become mindful is to allow oneself to sit in the presence of gain and loss and of sorrow and suffering and beauty and love and breathe and say yes, as if you can bow to all of that. It brings us to the place of rest a connectedness with this human life as we've been given it, without judging, without expecting. And when I say without judging, it doesn't mean you can't make decisions. But the decisions come from a deeper, more silent place than all our fears when we sit in the presence of our life. So it's not a kind of quality that, you know, oh, now I'm becoming spiritual. Spare your friends, right? Um, It's an embodied human and divine sort of wedding. Um, Somebody talked about belonging because we live in a culture where there's so little belonging in some ways, you know, except in your chat room or something like that. But there's something a little tenuous about chat room belonging, isn't there? One small crash and... You know, it's gone. (laughs) And the real belonging is the belonging in the moment. There is only one belonging. Are you here? Are you here for the sunset or the sunrise or the look in the eyes of someone 
you know, that you've returned to, to, to see for the, maybe the thousandth time, but they're not the same person. William Carlos Williams writes, I've had my dreams like others, and they've come to nothing, so that I remain now carelessly with feet planted on the ground and look up at the spring sky, (coughs) feeling my clothes about me, the weight of my body in my shoes, the rim of my hat, the air passing in and out at my nose, and decide to dream no more. And that isn't to say that dreams don't have their place, because they also are quite magical. But it's what he's talking about is not the dreams that are the creative, beautiful imagination of life, but the dreams that stop us from living. So to be mindful is to include all this. And the only way you can do it, quite honestly, is also to include the bad stuff. The, let's see, loss letting go, worry, attachment. And attachment isn't even bad. There's healthy attachment, like a mother to a child. Without it, the child would um, in some way be destroyed without proper attachment. But then there's the attachment that causes suffering. And you know what mindfulness does? It shows the difference. And you get to learn, ooh, this one really burns. It's somebody, I think Stephen Levine, called attachment rope burn, right? <laughs> it's the holding on to something that is actually trying to change. Do you understand? So to be mindful to be, is to be wakeful, to see the dance of life as it changes as it moves, as it breathes breathes itself, and its gain and loss, and praise and blame, and joy and sorrow, and sorrow and joy, and birth and death. Anybody not have that? So why do we look, said Jocelyn King, this wonderful old Buddhist elder, this woman who'd practiced in Burma for years, she said, we're always trapped in the quicksand of somethingness, trying to make it and hold it, instead of letting go into the firm ground of emptiness. And emptiness simply means this moment, just now, these words, this experience of embodied humanity and sounds that come and go, and the fact that this moment will be no more. But the next one follows, that winter is followed by spring. (laughs) To be in this way takes a kind of courage, um, which I'll come to in a moment, one story of mindfulness, Ruth Dennison, who some of you may know, she's kind of the elder and um, one of the founders of teaching mindfulness meditation in this country for the last 25 or 30 years. Um, and she was taking care of, has been taking care of her husband, Henry, uh, who's in his 80s and has Alzheimer's. And it started to get worse and worse. She has a little meditation center out near Joshua Tree, and Henry is a house in L.A. Henry was living there, and she would go in and try to tend him. And as he got more lost, um, he couldn't feed himself well, or he'd get lost out in the neighborhood, and he started a fire, burned part of the house down, because he forgot that he'd turned the stove on. So she gets up you know, early in the morning, would drive in, tend to Henry, drive back, teach her retreat, drive back and forth, you know, two, three, four hours each way, getting exhausted. She went to teach in Oregon um, a few years ago in the midst of this and arrived there to a room full of people was set up and she was exhausted. And she started to teach about living in the reality of the present, that we can do that as human beings, this mindfulness. We, the courage to be where we are, the freedom of it. And then she said, and let me tell you, it's not easy when things are difficult. And she told the story of Henry and the fire and the house and how hard it was to stay present with that. She went on doing more teachings, and then she said, did I tell you about Henry and the fire? And told the whole story all over again. And then went on and taught some more about being present in your body and your breath. She said, oh, and I need to tell you what happened with my husband, Henry, and the fire, and told the whole story all over a third time. Well, people freaked, basically. <laughs> they said, oh, my God, you know, it's not Henry who has Alzheimer's, right? 
it's Ruth too. Um, and so a few stood up to leave, like, this is, this is too much. And they were going out the doors, all this room full of people, and she said, wait, you know, I can just hear her say with her little German accent, wait, where are you going? She said, and before you go, I want you to look at your expectations. What did you come here expecting to see tonight? So that stopped them in their tracks for a moment. They stood there. She said, because tonight you have a chance to see something very unusual. They looked at her. She said, you have a chance to see a senior Dharma teacher fail because I have no idea what I have just said. And it turned out that it was just that she was exhausted and a couple days sleep and rest and all her memory and everything came back as it did and she's absolutely fine. But what an amazing power to be in the midst of even that, of losing who you are, that way we take ourselves to be, and to bow to it and say, this is how it is. Can you be here for this too? And this, says the Buddha, is the gateway to the deathless, the gateway to freedom. Because when we can be present for gain and loss and sorrow and beauty, then the heart, the sure heart's release is just there in the reality of where we are. Now with this quality of attention in our lives and all these things that people have asked about, there are three arousing qualities that come with it as we awaken. One of them is the quality of energy, of aliveness itself. Another poem for you. Find it. From Mary Oliver, called The Deer. You never know. It's a good place to start, isn't it? (laughs) My teacher used to say that all the time. You never know. Don't know. Not sure, are you? The body of night opens like a river. It drifts upward like white smoke, like so many wrappings of mist. And on the hillside, two deer are walking along, just as though this wasn't the owned, tilled earth of today, but the past. I do not see them the next day or the next, but in my mind's eye, they are there, in the long grass like two sisters. This is earnest work. Each of us is given only so many mornings to do it, to look around and love the oily fur of our lives, the hoof and grass-stained muzzle. Days I don't do this, I feel the terror of idleness, like a red thirst. Death isn't just an idea. When we die, the body breaks open like a river. The old body goes on, climbing the hill. And so the quality that this invites us to from awareness is this mystery of what it is to make wise effort in spiritual practice. And the real effort isn't to change yourself or make yourself someone else, which we've tried a long time rather unsuccessfully. The real effort is to be where we are without resisting or grasping to say, yes, I'm here in this day and in this morning, as Mary Oliver speaks of. You know, the earnest work. Each one of us is given only so many mornings to do it, to look around and love. So the wise effort, the factor of energy and the qualities of enlightenment is connecting with that capacity to be alive and present. And in it, there's a kind of trust that comes. Because sometimes we're afraid if I'm really here, if I really love or if I really listen deeply, you know, you get to meet the Dalai Lama sometimes, you know, at various Buddhist meetings and conference and things I have had a chance to have a conversation with the Dalai Lama and one of the very best things about him is how much attention he gives to each person he meets it's just stunning it's so beautiful but we're somehow afraid that if we give that kind of attention to a breath or our child or what we're cooking or something that we'll lose it 
we got to keep worrying and thinking and remembering somehow, or that we only have so much aliveness. Like a little battery, it's going to run out. I don't have much love. I better kind of check the meter here and see whether I've used up my quotient of love for today or not. But there is instead a very deep knowing that comes to us that's different than this body of fear, but that's deeper in the heart, that says yes to life, yes, I can be present, that knows that it's possible for you and for me. Another poem, if I can find it, from Rumi. Where are you? The baby hawk stands on the edge of its nest all day. Then he hears a whistle, come to me. Come to me. How could she not fly toward that? A letter arrives that says, You've flapped and fluttered against limits long enough. You've been a bird without wings in a house without doors or windows. Compassion builds a door. Courage cuts a key. Ask. Step off into the air like a baby hawk. Strut proudly into the sunlight, not looking back. Take sips of this pure wine being poured. Don't mind if you've been given a dirty cup. It's nothing. (laughs) So Rumi is talking about this invitation to enter each moment and say, yes, here is what is given. The sorrows, the loss, the negative emotions, the anger that comes. Bow to that and say, wow, today... The stars, the gods have given me rage and anger. Let me sit with that for a moment and see what to do with that. Because everybody has it sometime, you know. Or today the stars have given me longing, deep desire, or stillness. And to find the capacity to say, yes, this too I can encompass, embrace with this heart, with this presence of awareness. And when you do, even when it gets desolate, when you worry and you cry and there's a sense of the emptiness that's not familiar or meaningless, if you stay and rest with it and tend it the way you would tend that baby in its nest till it's ready to fly, it will fly. Um, things always change. It's the most predictable of all things. They change. I remember being in the Cambodian refugee camp um, 20-some years ago. It's a terrible, desolate place in the dry season, in the hot fields with these tiny little bamboo huts, 50,000 of them, one row after another. People who had lost everything half their families gone, the villages burned, and kind of shell-shocked. And I got to the refugee camps to begin to do a bit of work there. After they'd been there for four months, some of them, or three months, or two months, or so. And what was astonishing was that each little hut, there was about, oh, half a meter, or a foot and a half between the huts, and then there were rows where you could walk between them. Each little hut had a yard, a front outside the door that was about a foot and a half wide and two feet long, something like that, of their own space. And in the majority of them, they had planted gardens. Mm. Just a little squash plant and a little bean plant. And they would go, it would take an hour to get water at the far end of the camp and then line for this huge pit well that was dug by a bulldozer and you'd have to wait in the hot sun. And they'd be carrying their buckets of water back to water these little plants. Because there is something in us that knows that whatever sorrows come, and we may be lost in them and may even need to be at certain times, that that's not the end of the story. That something else will come, because it always does. And this factor of enlightenment knows that and is willing to rest and trust and engage in life. And it's coupled with what's called clarity, investigation, the energy to see clearly. Not only do we show up and say, all right, here I am. Let me be aware 
let me be awake in this. But the willingness then to see what is true. As Krishnamurti said, when the mind is still, tranquil, not wanting a single thing, that's what a still mind is. It's not that it doesn't have thoughts, but it's not caught in being someplace else. When we're still and tranquil, not wanting a single thing, then it is possible to see what is true. And it is the truth that liberates and not your efforts to be free. It is by seeing what is so that we become free. And this is that clarity of mind. You know, initially spiritual practice seems so hard, partly because we judge everything so much, especially you know who. And we struggle and we want things to be different and our mind should be quiet and our body should be different and other people should certainly be different. <laughs> you know. And the best teachings and teachers don't so much tell you what you should see and how things are. They make the conditions so you can see for yourself. The practice makes those conditions. I remember Zen Master Kusan, the fr- whose name, his name was translated in English, Nine Mountains, because he lived in Nine Mountains Monastery in Korea. He was one of the great old patriarch, great masters of Korean Zen. And he came to the three-month retreat one year that we were leading in Massachusetts. At the end, special things, and Master gets up. Oh, everyone can't wait. You know, they've been sitting for so many, many, many long weeks. And he got up and he looked and shook his head and said, Oh, what you do this practice, being aware, no good. (laughs) Just spent three months suffering doing this. It's no good. You know, this not get you enlightened. Oh, my God. You know, people's faces were in shock. He said, only one practice. He had this, you know, Zen staff, Zen stick. And he banged his stick. What is this? What is this? What is this? This life. What is this? To see and say, well, is that who you are? Are you all those stories? Are you the body of fear? Are you the small sense of self? I hope not. I mean, you might be for a while, but it's not our true nature. And to look into what is this and see it really deeply. To examine the body of fear, to examine attachment or forgiveness. If it's forgiveness for somebody else, it doesn't even help them. I mean, they could be in Hawaii having a vacation now anyway, right? It's not going to make much difference to them. Who does it make a difference to? Where is suffering? And what is freedom? Someone went to the Zen master and said, you know, Master, would you teach me about liberation from bondage? And the master looked back and said, well, whoever said you were in bondage? So this investigation looks at what creates suffering, limitation, and looks at the same clear seeing, the same nature of body and mind, and says, what are the moments that we're free? Because we all have them. My teacher, Buddha Dasa, called it everyday nirvana. You know, that we all have those moments of, oh, well, I was really caught, wasn't I? And now, look at this that this is the capacity of mind and of heart. So it's to see for yourself. And this isn't a lot of knowledge. I mean, it's not like you have to study texts and things like that. It's something much more mysterious. (sighs) To see the way things are and to really be willing to look, a kind of dignity to it. I remember sitting with a friend who died in the early years of the AIDS epidemic. Lovely man. And he had gone back to his family, um, who'd never accepted him as a gay man, um, once he found out he had AIDS. And um, it was really hard. Again, it was early on in this, and so much misunderstanding, and they were really angry in some way. And even his sister said to him, because he'd sort of been the ne'er-do-well, he'd never... He'd had a career and he'd sort of stopped it and his sister was like the vice president of some big company in New York and, you know, 
soccer mom on the side and all, you know, all the kind of... And she looked at me and she said, you know, she, she, at one point, she said, here you are dying and what have you done with your life? Imagine saying that to somebody. And it really made him look... And partly I think she said it because she was so frightened and hurt by his dying. She didn't know what else to do. And, you know, when we're hurt, you know what we do. We get angry sometimes instead of saying, I'm really afraid or this really hurts me. Um, but she didn't know how to do that. She didn't know how to see what was there. So she, that's what she said. But he took it as a koan. He said, all right, what have I done with my life? <laughs> Somebody's asking, okay, I better look. You know, and it was frightening in a way. And he said he lay there for a long time and he thought about it. And the next day he said, you know, I want to answer your question. He said, I have, um, I've done two things. He said, I've been kind to people. So he was a very sweet guy whose nature was really to be respectful and kind to others. He said, I've been kind to people. And I found the Dharma. And maybe that's enough for one lifetime what he said. So it's not big in a certain way. You don't need to know a lot. But it's something that's really of essence to our heart. With this then also comes the next factor of enlightenment of joy, rapture, delight, interest. In Thai the word is jai pong sai. Um, the idea is hopefully, of spiritual practice is to lead to certain freedom and liberation and happiness. Otherwise, why do it? Um, to discover that capacity of joy that is there when we are free. We confuse joy sometimes with pleasure. And there's nothing wrong with pleasure with a beautiful, you know, sunset and a nice glass of wine and a great poem and all of those. Pleasurable things are fine, but you know how pleasure is. It's fleeting. And if you keep going after it, trying to get one pleasure after another after another, well, first of all, you're aging, you know, and it doesn't work that well after a while. It just doesn't. I mean, you can try, but it's not how it works. Isn't it true? You know, and also it's awfully tiresome. It's, all, it's actually pretty tiresome. You know, we've talked about that. So there's there's some other source of happiness that isn't just pleasure. And I don't mean that it's not fine to have comfort or pleasure when it's given to us. It's not always there, but we happen to live outwardly in a very, um, for the most part, in a very um, pleasant conditions as the human realm goes. But the real pleasure or delight is the delight of being alive, of seeing the quince, and the plum blossoms that are just coming out, and the magnolia blossoms, um, of uh, saying goodbye to your child or your lover or your, your friend in a way that is a really meaningful goodbye, because you don't know if you'll see them again, um, is caring for this body, not, you know, because it's supposed to look like some magazine picture, um, in the best light on the right day with the best makeup and a good photographer, you know. Um, but rather there is within us um, a natural joy. And you know it. You knew it as a kid. It was there in you. I mean, it might have been robbed or, or abused or something shut down, but it is there in every being that's alive. You look at kittens and puppies and baby goats and whatever, and you just smile, you laugh, because they're playful. And there's a playful quality to this factor of enlightenment where life becomes more of a dance and less of a contraction. There's a satisfaction not in looking for something else, but in being where we are. And these qualities, which I've talked about, mindfulness and energy or aliveness and investigation or clarity of seeing what's true, and the lightness, the joy. What is the poem from Rumi? He says, Do not sit long with sadness, my friend. When you go into a garden, do you look at thorns or flowers? Spend more time with roses and jasmine. 
to let oneself see that even in the sorrows of the world, that all these qualities then, which in a sense are the uplifting qualities of heart, are balanced with several stabilizing qualities. And that's sort of for the negative emotions that someone said. In some way you want to welcome them and invite them for tea, your anger, your fear, betrayal, give them tea. But also, you know, you want to put a flower on the table. Say, all right, let's be angry, but I'm going to write a poem about anger, right? I am enraged. It's a very interesting poem. Make it beautiful. So I can make it an interesting poem. So these aliveness, these qualities of presence, are balanced by three stabilizing qualities that I have a little time to go to. And they're concentration, calm, and equanimity. Concentration is this capacity of steadiness that's missing a lot in our 15-second, you know, um, advertising attention span culture. Uh, And it's missing even in Western psychology. We know how to look at the mind in some way, but we don't know how to quiet it. Imagine that. We don't know how to quiet the mind. God help us. Right? But it's possible. And it's possible for everyone. The mind actually wants to come to rest if we know the conditions, if we remember. And it, you know, it grows. If you read a good novel, um, at first you start a couple of pages, you're reading it, and people come in the room and that you're distracted by them. But if, you know, you're reading Agatha and you're getting near the end and you want to find out, you know, who did it, and you're really into the plot, right? And people can walk in the room, walk out, you don't even notice them because you are so present for that. And the same can be true in music or computer programming or gardening or teaching or lovemaking. It's the capacity to be present without distraction. And it's an art that we can learn, and it's a, something that's natural to us that could, we can return to. Somebody asked about focus and intention. The seed of intention is like the seed in the garden. Concentration is the watering of it, the tending of it, the keeping the insects away as it starts to grow. It's the willingness to place our intention there and to nourish it. And then we realize this nourishing is a natural capacity, a non-distractedness. And there's a real purity to it. Whatever you tend, whether it is your garden, or it is your work, you know, or it is another person. There are different kinds of samadhi. This is the translation of the word samadhi. All these kind of ecstatic samadhis, and it's kind of cool, you know, it's good to have them. And realize that we're not made just of physical things, we're also made of light. And this is a very literal human experience with certain training. Um, not everybody can do it, but probably half the people in the room could do it with, with some certain kinds of training. You can dissolve your body into light. Ah, fantastic. You know, without drugs even, right? But um, then it goes away. And you say, well, that was cool, but, you know, now I have to pay the mortgage. Or I have to, you know, go pick up my partner or whatever it is, and you go shopping for food, so forth. There's another kind of samadhi, which is called kanika, or moment-to-moment samadhi. It is the quality of wholeness or presence. It has a kind of dignity to it and power when we are tending fully, without distraction, to what is here in this moment, and then this one, and then this one. And life becomes still when we have that, and richer and fuller. It is the planting of an intention and then the following through with that intention, the tending of it over and over again. This quality of steadiness, which we've forgotten in our culture, but comes back when you meditate or you do spiritual practice of some kind or some art, is also wedded to the next factor of enlightenment, which is calm or peacefulness. And the very simple statement is that peace is possible. I mean, we look at the human realm, and there's a lot of war and conflict and ambition and so forth, and those are part of the energies of human life. If that was all there was, we would be in grave trouble, much worse than we are. But it's also possible, as my teacher Ajahn Chah said, it's possible to stop the war. 
We human beings, he said, are constantly in combat. Let me see if I can find it. At war to escape the fact of being so limited by so many circumstances we cannot control. It's true, isn't it? All these things we can't control. You can hardly control your own mind, not to speak of the people around you or other things. But instead of escaping, we continue to create suffering by waging war with what is evil and with what is good and waging war with what is too small or too big or with what is too short or too long or right or wrong, courageously carrying on the battle. The invitation of awakening is to step out of the battle, to stop the war. Remember the story of Bill Moyers when he was the press secretary for Lyndon Johnson in the the White House. And at one luncheon, because Moyers was also trained as a minister, he was asked to say grace for this, you know, cabinet meeting luncheon. And he was kind of saying his grace. And from the end of the table, Lyndon Johnson yelled out, speak up, Bill, I can't hear a damn thing, you know, being Johnson. And Moyers looked up and said, I wasn't addressing you, Mr. President. (laughs) 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 To step out of the war is really to step out of our wanting. Wanting it to be different, wanting to be bigger or smaller or quieter or change in some way. And just to be with things as they are, just this moment, just this much, just this that we're given. This body, this breath, this relaxation into where we are, this tension and holding that with ease just this much, without judging. And then things start to get simple and unpretentious and clear. Because ambition, and ambition's okay, it's one of the human things. I like to think that ambition turns into service so that it shifts from being, you know, I mean, I I have this picture of my in my mind of my daughter, as all little kids are at three years old in her tutu, you know, climbing up on the table in the living room and saying, look at me, you know that. And a lot of ambition's that, actually. Mwah, look at me, and so forth. And it's okay. It's probably because we didn't get enough of the real love that um, makes somebody say, oh, I have been looked at. Um, But I believe that that ambition turns actually into service. Because what makes us happy is to give love as well as to be seen. And this peace comes when we can step out of wanting. Not that the wanting isn't there, but we're not so identified with it anymore, that we can step out of that and let the world be as it is and find that place that's undisturbed by all things. The phrase from Dame Julian of Norwich where she says, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. That T.S. Eliot uses in the last part of the four quartets. Mm. When you meet someone who's wise, or someone who's having a wise moment, (laughs) right? (sighs) It's such a, a, it's kind of a rest. Because in the eyes of wisdom is an acceptance and a peace that's not a resignation from the world. It's actually, there's an aliveness. There's a sympathy and compassion, but there isn't a struggle. It's the end of struggle. An undisturbedness to be without anxiety about the non-perfection of the world. And the last quality of the factors of enlightenment is equanimity, which is the quality of perfect balance, of realizing that if you seek for the eternal or eternity, it's not something that happens to you after you die, if you're lucky. If it's eternity, it's always here. And this is it. And eternity means coming to rest 
in that which is timeless, in the reality of the present, in which all this dance happens, but underneath which is this vast space or silence. The Buddha lived in nirvana, it's said, right? And living in nirvana, he ate, he slept, he talked to people, he made plans, he organized the building of monasteries, he did healings with people or, you know, uh, solved problems, had political conversations in nirvana. So what does that mean? Obviously, it doesn't mean, you know, that your eyes are closed and nirvana is someplace else. Someone once asked a, an Indian sage about this, a friend of mine, and, you know, all these things, and he said, from that place, nothing happens. That was his answer. From that place, nothing happens. Let's see. Zhuang Su puts it this way. Zhuang Su, the Taoist sage. He said, when a man is crossing a river and an empty boat collides with his own skiff, he will shout, oh no, and he will not shout and not become angry, and all because there is no one in the boat. But if there is another man in the boat, he will shout at him to steer clear and shout yet again and again and get angry, and all because there is someone in the boat. (laughs) If you can empty your boat crossing the river of the world, he says, no one will shout at you and no one will be angry. In the system of chakras, the quality of equanimity is related to the crown chakra, the thousand petal lotus it's sometimes described as. It's the place in which one, uh, where consciousness rises to look at the dance of life, to experience it, and yet in some way to realize that it happens to no one, that no one is born and no one dies. Even the person here doesn't exist the way you think you are. I mean, you were a child, that's a different person. And you'll be a very old person, that's a different one. You know, and then you'll be a corpse. That's a different one still. It is. You don't think that's going to happen? Hey, look again. Right? And isn't that amazing? Because it all seems so real. And then you're not going to be here. In this way, and all these people who relate to you, you're, you're going to be absent. And it seems like it all revolves around this one person, doesn't it? I mean, all these sights and sounds and conversations and so forth. But it's very tentative. That is not who we are. It is given to us to have this human experience for a certain time. But this place of understanding sees the dance of birth and death and rests like a mountain where storms come and go and the sun shines and the snow falls. And what does the mountain do? Nothing. The mountain is there receiving it all, resting in the midst of it, allowing wild things and beautiful things and pastoral things but really being of the earth herself. It's amazing to rest in that place. And we all have it at times. It comes alive in us as we grow and mature in our wisdom. I mean, there was Gandhi. He was being... um, uh, There was a a person who was trying to assassinate him and held up a gun, and then he was grabbed by the the, uh, Indian police. This wasn't the time he was shot to death, but before that... um, And this man was being dragged away. And Gandhi's first response was, Oh, that poor man, what will happen to him now that he has failed his assignment? Imagine that. Imagine that being the response of somebody who was grabbed before he could shoot you. You know, oh my. I mean, what a kind of perspective to have on things. This is um, William Butler Yeats writing from the dialogue of self and soul toward the end of his life. A living man is blind and drinks his drop. What matter if the ditches are impure? What matter if I live it all once more and endure that toil of growing up? The ignominy of boyhood, the distress of boyhood changing into man, the unfinished man in his pain brought face to face with his own clumsiness. He's letting himself see the human predicament pretty clearly. I am content 
to live it all again and yet again if it be life to pitch into the frog spawn of a blind man's ditch a blind man battering blind men <laughs> or into that most fecund ditch of all the folly that a man does or must suffer if he woos a proud woman not kindred of his soul that's because poor Yeats had fallen in love with this great beauty, Maud Gunn, and, and, and um, for years pined after her and, and suffered. So he talks about, you know, all the... You, you've done it. You, you know. <laughs> all the follies, you know, and the ignominy and the distress and things like that. He says, I am content to follow to its source every event in action and in thought, measure the lot, forgive myself the lot. When such as I cast out remorse, so great a sweetness flows into the breast that we must laugh and we must sing and we are blessed by everything and everything we look upon is blessed. And from this place, to look back, as Yeats is doing, upon one's life and one's follies and one's genuine tragedies, which there are in many of our lives, and one's attempts to love awkwardly as they are, and to see it all and for measure the lot and forgive oneself the lot. What a line, to measure the lot and forgive oneself the lot. And from that place, it's not just the mind that awakens, but it's the mind and heart that awaken together. We are blessed, and everything we look upon is blessed. So this is the invitation of the factors of enlightenment, to rest in the eternal present with the awareness that doesn't get caught in the dance, but bows to it all and can be here with aliveness and energy, with the clear seeing of truth and caring for it as it is, with a joy that's the joy that was your birthright, that was there as a child, that's built into the world, a joy that holds both pleasure and pain as still precious. And to do so from a place of steadiness that we learn and reconnect with, of concentration and wholeness, of calm and stillness, and of the great equanimity that measures the lot and forgives ourselves the lot so that all that we look upon is blessed.